how do I move on? Cool. All right, sorry about that. So I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about the kind of computational themes that are common to a lot of the problems we work on in my group. So when we try to mo build models of real world systems or real world data sets because we want to make predictions about the future or because we want to support uh, uh, analytic decision making, we typically encounter three uh, major sources of difficulties. The first one is that real world systems are very complex. There are lots of variables, lots of, lots of features that we have to consider. And this naturally leads to some very high dimensional spaces that we have to deal with if we want to reason about a realistic system, a realistic model of the, of the world. The second major challenge is that we typically have limited information about the systems we want to model. There could be uncertainty in the parameters, there could be noisy measurements, there could be quantities that we don't get to observe. So if we want to build robust models, we have to take uncertainty into account and we have to consider stochastic models. And finally, we're typically building these models because we have in mind some kind of task that we want to solve. And so it's often the case that we also have to consider some kind of preference or utility function that kind of encodes uh, desirable outcomes. And we also have to be able to optimize for that. Now, these are some very important challenges that have been studied for a long time in a variety of different fields, uh, in management science, economics, various branches of engineering. They are, they are, they are clearly central to uh, computer science, AI, and machine learning. They also come up in statistics, operations research, even statistical physics. And in my group, we do a lot of work on developing new uh, modeling frameworks and algorithms to deal with these challenges. And they are often motivated by problems in this field of computational sustainability. Uh, we've been working on a range of problems in this space, uh, ranging from how to use high resolution satellite images to build very accurate poverty maps in developing countries, using uh, remotely sensed data to uh, do, uh, be able to estimate uh, crop yields at a large scale, use stochastic optimization techniques to use these uh, uh, yield forecasts to actually improve food productivity using AI techniques. And also we've been doing some work in the material science on how to use AI and machine learning to speed up the materials discovery process. That's the kind of thing uh, John was talking about before. And I will tell you a little bit more about that in the second part of the talk. So since uh, we don't have much time, I will just give you a very high level overview about these projects. I'm around today. Uh, please get in, you know, talk to me. I'm happy to tell you more about each of these projects. My students are also here and they can tell you more about, about them. So let me start with poverty mapping. So uh, ending extreme poverty is the number one goal on the 2030 development agenda by the United Nations. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in this case is that we have very limited data in developing countries, uh, even in, about poverty, as also Tom was mentioning before. So here I'm showing a map of Africa, and for each country I'm showing the availability of survey data in the, in the decade from 2000 to 2010. You can see a lot of the countries are white, and that means that there is no survey data available for that decade for that country. As you can imagine, that's a problem because if we don't have data, we don't know how well we're doing. We don't know whether we're meeting this target of eliminating poverty or not. We don't know if policies are working or not. We don't know what drives the variation of, of poverty in, in developing countries. So what we tried to do was to use AI and machine learning to come up with ways to estimate poverty using unconventional data sources. And in particular, one thing we, we looked at is uh, uh, remote sensing data. Uh, remote sensing is becoming cheaper much uh, and, and getting better and better uh, with new technologies. There's, the video is not playing, but these days you can get high resolution videos from space. They are commercially available uh, from a startup in the Bay Area. It was recently acquired by Google. But so we're getting this uh, incredibly uh, interesting data with a lot of information about the things we might care about. You can imagine that you can infer all sorts of things from this kind of data. You can infer things about economic activities. You can infer things about agricultural <coughs> deforestation, land cover changes. And we can use AI techniques to infer this information from the images automatically. And so in particular, what we did is we developed a model that takes as input high resolution images and estimates uh, essentially poverty rates for the households in that area. And the way the model works is that uh, it uh, recognizes um, properties in the image that are related to economic activity. So it looks for the roads, it looks for roof types, it looks for um, properties of the landscape. And then it combines all these features into a big statistical model that is used to, to estimate poverty. The result that the model is very accurate and uh, we can use it to build this very high resolution 
poverty maps in a very scalable way. The only thing that it needs are basically images, which are available for the whole world with, with high resolution. So here you can see the kind of models that you can generate for a country, say Uganda. We can download uh, several hundred thousand images or millions of images that cover the entire country, and we can use them to estimate poverty, the distribution of poverty in the country. You can see the images that we get on the left, uh, they kind of match with the, the most up-to-date map that we have for the country. Most of the poverty is in the northern part of the country, and that's what we expect. That's sort of the part that was affected by uh, civil war. So this is getting a lot of attention from uh, economists. They're very excited about the opportunities that these kind of new data sets provide them to, uh, to do research on, on poverty. We're getting a lot of requests uh, from uh, organizations that they, they want to look at this data, they want to use it, from NGOs, also from a government organization. Uh, we're talking to people at the World Bank. There is a group there that has been working on drafting a new constitution for Somalia. That's a country for which they have no data at all. It's too dangerous to send people and collecting data on the ground. And so we're pretty excited about uh, using these kind of models to, to help them out in their work. Uh, more recently, we've also been looking at estimating crop yields using remote sense data. These are kind of the, this is in the in the Midwest, but you can see that we can estimate crop yields at the field level again using passively collected cheap uh, data that is, that is publicly available. Uh, that's a big problem. We, well, we know that agriculture is an important component of the economy in developing countries, so we're hoping to extend these models to developing countries as well. Uh, it's also a big issue, and we know food security is a big problem. There is going to be 2 billion more people that we're going to have to feed by 2050, and we know that information technology and AI techniques will have to play a role there. One way they can help is we can use a, a, a stochastic optimization and AI techniques to actually improve food productivity. We've been able to use these yield, uh, crop yield models to actually uh, improve uh, agricultural productivity. We participated in um, crop challenges at Informs that was organized by Syngenta. That's a big multinational corporation in the agrochemical uh, field. And they basically asked this problem that they have hundreds of different seed varieties and which one should you use for a given location to maximize food productivity. And we showed that by using AI techniques and basically stochastic optimization technologies, uh, we were able to come up with very good solutions that do much better than the kind of uh, techniques that they were using before. And so we won the, f the first prize at that challenge. So uh, now for the second part of the talk, I'll give you a little bit of uh, detail on the materials discovery work. So using AI and machine learning techniques to speed up the discovery process of new materials, the kind of stuff John uh, talked about before in, the, in, the, in his talk. So the high level idea is uh, the following. Are we would really like to be able to speed up the discovery process of new energy materials. Currently, uh, the, the, the process is very slow. And one of the reasons is that there are a lot of humans involved in the loop. So there is a material scientist that has to come up with an experiment, actually do the experiment, collect the data, analyze the data, and then sort of repeat these two. So the idea here is, can we actually speed up this process by uh, using AI techniques to help the, the, the scientists and make their life easier and speed up the process as much as possible. So clearly the f most natural place where we can help is data analysis. So that's some work we've been doing in collaboration with the people at Slack, the, the linear accelerator at Stanford. So this is a slightly different data from the one that uh, John was talking about. These are also x-rays, but it's a slightly different technique that my collaborators there are, are developing. So we're trying to understand how the core and the structure of a sample we have this, uh, this technology that produces a stack of images corresponding to different uh, energy x-ray energy levels. And what you get is basically for each pixel, you get to see an uh, x-ray uh, data that looks like that, or a function of energy using different intensity levels. And uh, it's a very scalable technique. They generate lots of data, like millions of spectra that can be collected in, in a few minutes. And the challenge as before is how do we actually analyze this data and make sense of it and understand the structure of the materials. Uh, one more minute. Yeah, I'm almost done. So here, the, the problem uh, before is basically do some kind of spectral and mixing. We get to see the data like there. The, 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 for each pixel, we get to see the, uh, uh, 
uh, an intensity that looks like that, and we want to identify the underlying components, the underlying materials, and come up with some kind of uh, chemical math in this case for a battery electrode that, that looks like that. So we came up with algorithms that can do that fairly efficiently, something that maybe we could use also in the Raman case that uh, John mentioned before. The challenge here is how are we gonna scale it up to even larger data sets that we, we are collecting and to understand actually the 3D structure of these samples. So very briefly, uh, let me finish up by telling you about some work we've been doing by actually improving the data collection process using AI techniques. This ties back to the idea of using vision optimization that Tom uh, mentioned before in his talk. Uh, so this is a collaboration again with LCLS. LCLS is the world's most, most powerful X-ray laser. Uh, it's a very powerful and useful machine. The beam time is oversubscribed by a factor of five, so lots of people want to use it. Uh, it's a very complex, very expensive machine. Lots of time is spent tuning it, like hundreds of hours per year. And so this is what it looks like. There is an operator that over time sets uh, some parameters, in this case, some magnet settings that you can see up there, sort of uh, uh, <coughs> get the, the beam in, in the right, uh, focused in the right way. They're spending a lot of time, a lot of money, it costs about $1,000 per minute to tune the machine. What we did is we used vision optimization and we figured out a way to do it automatically. You can actually <coughs> cut down the time by a factor of three, as you can see here, to get even better uh, results. And these are actually live runs. We've actually been running it on the, on the real machine. And so we're, we're pretty excited about, uh, about uh, uh, pushing this even further. And so yeah, with that, I would like to conclude and thank my collaborators. The students are here. If you want to hear more about the, the projects, you, you can talk to them or, or to me. Thanks.